at first it was just one more friend to bring in for me to visit and nurture. Um, and then, and then they kind of took over and that was kind of rude. Welcome to Rover Says, the podcast where we share stories about the weird and wonderful things animals say when they open up to pet psychics. I'm your host, Nancy Aziz. Oh, well, some people would say it's very much like Sleeping Beauty because I had butterflies and bees and... Um, birds, lots of birds. Um, and they really came in after my dog had passed, which I think is one reason the rats felt safer. It's like, oh, the big, huge cattle dog is gone. Um, but it's sort of my oasis. That's Sue Seely. She lives in a Northern California beach town and her backyard with its abundant trees and flowering plants is her happy place. It's where she comes to do Qigong, an ancient Chinese practice that uses movement and meditation. It's also where she comes to feel connected. It's my place where I could just ground like literally the little teeny areas of dirt. I stick my bare feet in so I can ground. Um, every night I come out my slider and especially if it's a clear night, I, I do Qigong. And I welcome in the moon. And since then, my daughter and her family have moved in with me. And so I often will take my granddaughter, who's two, out there. And we do Qigong and we eat the moon. And it's just a sweet, sacred space. After Sue's dog, Isabel, passed away four years ago, she felt the need to connect with other animals, and that meant welcoming the local wildlife into her yard, birds and possums, raccoons and squirrels, bunnies, and the like. And then I noticed a couple of what I thought were mice that turned out to be rats, and so I'd kind of feed them, thinking I shouldn't do that, and long story short, you know, I would see one or two in my bird feeder and then one day one night I opened up my slider to my bedroom I always go out at night the long pole the feeder and there were had to have been way over a dozen of them up the pole in the feeder on top of the feeder and I just went oh my god that's gross <laughs> my what I thought were sweet little friends ended up being a tribe and it kind of creeped me out. Having all these rats out there, like what did that do to your sweet sacred space? <laughs> well, at first, like I said, I thought, oh, well, you know, they're animals. They're, they have souls. They, they're sweet beings of the universe. I know they're can be creepy to some and I'd rather them not be in my house and I don't kiss them. Um, but when there were just a few, I thought, well, who's to say that this is your home versus this is my home? You know, they live here too. You know, I, I've i had neighbors squawking about saying we shouldn't feed, um, uh, put seed in our feeders. We shouldn't feed the birds because it brings them and then they, you know, birds are dirty. And I think, wow, what a, what a sad way to live and here I am welcoming them and going okay rats love carrots didn't know that they like all kinds of things because they like everything so it at first it was just one more friend to bring in for me to visit and nurture um, and then and then they kind of took over and that was kind of rude Sue had been talking with an animal communicator about her beloved cattle dog, Isabel, who had recently passed away, and she casually mentioned her growing rat problem. And I'm not sure how we morphed into it, but I mentioned my story about the rats. And Shannon had made some suggestions. One thing was she um, told me about her, uh, she had a video that, talked about how to communicate with animals. And that was really helpful. And one thing I did know um, is to communicate them with 
pictures in your mind. And that's something that I've known and I've done a few times throughout the years. I'm a Reiki master and hypnotherapist and I practice all that woo-woo stuff, right? And, um, but what I didn't know is when she said, don't picture what you don't want them to do. And gave the example, if you don't want your dog jumping on the couch, we often think of them jumping on the couch and then we get mad. And they don't understand why we're mad because we just showed them a picture of them jumping on the couch. And so I went, okay, got it, got it. And I, after we ended our beautiful call, I meditated a few times for a few days. Um, however, it was always in my mind, like I was always connecting and talking to these critters and showing them. I just asked, please show them a new home. New universe, spirit, please show them a new home. And I pictured them packing up their little rat bags and marching away and some going somewhere else and being safe and being happy about leaving my space. Shortly afterwards, neighborhood cats started coming into Sue's yard. And then probably like the third day, um, I was in my living room. I looked out my window and I saw a cute little rat with these cute little ears in the feeder. And I said, oh, hello, friend. It's time for you to move on. And I had a little talk with him. About half an hour later, I'm in my bedroom and I hear this sound, really weird sound. And I'm looking and I look out my bedroom window and the fence behind my bedroom window is about three feet. And I see this big old fat hawk, which I've never seen a hawk in my yard or in the area. Um, not that they're not there, obviously, but I just never have seen them. There's usually crows, but there's this big old fat hawk on the fence and draped over it was my little mouse friend. I just said hello to, hello friend. And there it was with its big old eyes and it was pecking at its head. And I had such uh, well, I'll just say mixed feelings, kind of bittersweet, like, oh, he's taking care of the rat problem. But I didn't expect this. He ate almost everything. And then the next day, whatever was left was gone. You know, when we send a communication out to a group, it's kind of like sending out a broadcast. That's Shannon Cutts the animal communicator Sue worked with. And so one of the interesting things that really just didn't pop up on my radar at the time when Sue and I were chatting of several years ago was the fact that this is a broadcast message. And it really brings to mind the story one of my business mentors shares about, you know, being in business, being an entrepreneur is kind of like being in the business of solving problems. And that comes in the form of lessons. And so if you don't get the lesson in the form of a pebble, then it'll turn into a rock. If you don't get the lesson in the form of a rock, it'll turn into a boulder. And it's kind of when I, when I retune into our initial conversation, Sue, and I really think about the dynamics of the guidance that I gave you, Basically, I told you, send out a broadcast message to make sure that all of the rodents would hear it. Well, guess who else heard it? <laughs> the neighborhood cats. The neighborhood hawks. Like It's like yelling out, free donuts, free hamburgers, free steak. So... And the, the rats were, you know, I mean, in paradise, right? Enjoying their little oasis, right? Because, and and here they are, and they're like, they're not really believing. They're like, they don't want to hear the truth. Like, <laughs> well, she says we need to leave, but we don't see any evidence of that around here. And the snacks are free flowing, and we get to hang out together every night. And this is a groovy space with good high vibe energy, so then the cats show up and that would be, you know, your broadcast was the equivalent of the pebble. The cats show up. Now we've got a rock. 
the rats are still not quite catching the hint. And so what shows up but a boulder in the form of the local hawk. And they finally understand that you were trying to give them the gift of keeping their lives, of getting out before the big guns rolled in. But of course, everybody heard that message. So just like the rats were finding a wonderful resource of food in the bird feeder, the cats and the hawks were like, ooh, let's have rats for dinner again tonight. So, and it is the circle of life, you know, and we all have choices, regardless of species. We all get to choose. Shannon works with domestic animals, helping their companions understand what they're trying to say. She also works with wild animals, from squirrels to rats to crows, and recently, sea turtles in the Galapagos Islands. Long before she was working as an animal communicator, and even before she knew she had the ability to connect with animals, she says she was sharing messages with them. She just didn't know it. One of my first real connections that I made with a wild being was ladybugs. And for so, so many years prior to recognizing that interspecies communication was actually happening, in my life that I was receiving messages and sending messages, I would, I would go through, you know, my challenges in my twenties and my thirties and my forties. And when I was really questioning the choice to follow the intuitive path, to take that next step out in faith, to make a difficult choice or have a challenging or just a brave making conversation, a single ladybug would appear. And this is where I really mm -hmm. began to feel the heartbeat of our wild neighbors. Like they didn't have any particular vested interest, at least not, nothing that I perceived at the time, or there was nothing in it for them, I guess is what I'm trying to say to encourage me, but it was deliberate enough. And I would find them in the strangest places, like one inside my guitar case after a particularly difficult evening of performing. I used to be a singer songwriter and, or one lived on my bedspread with me for three days when I was so desperately sick with the flu and was losing work and was, you know, back in the hourly wages days or finding one at a difficult and soul killing temp job I was doing and finding one <laughs> inside this high rise building crawling on the underside of the banister as I walked up the stairs. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. I was like, there mm -hmm. is a benevolence here that I am tuning into that I do not even begin to understand, but it is just over the years, over the years, over the years. It's my first experience of what I now call making deposits into your trust bank. Cause it's like, we have to convince our left brain mind that the interspecies relationship exists. There isn't any tangible outer proof of it, at least not yet. Shannon, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how talking with wild animals is different than talking with companion animals. It's very different and interesting to address wild animals. And I find often necessary to make a distinction between whether I am wanting to communicate with the collective consciousness or with an, one individual in that species group. Mm. Another, um, another big difference is in the types of questions that we tend to ask and the different energy that those questions carry with them. We don't tend to make as many assumptions because we don't have as much 3D left brain data or information to go on. So there's there tends to be a more open-ended curiosity if I'm reaching out to the squirrels in my attic, which is, that's another one of my animal communication stories with wild animals. But if I'm reaching out to the, the wild, the squirrels in my attic, um, 
I'm just curious about what they need. Why did they choose my attic? Um, how they feel about me being on their property. <laughs> You know, just really kind of turning a lot of our assumptions as human animals about this is my planet, this is my home, this is my piece of land, really turn, kind of turning those on its ear. Anyone who has a sincere desire to communicate with a wild animal versus to lay down the law or to solve a problem is instantly going to feel a shift into so hard to put into words, but it's what I can only describe as species equality. Mm. It's truly a, a, a conversation between equals. It's an even negotiation. It's not like we can nab our cat or our bird and shove them in a carrier and take them to the vet. I mean, mm. we can try, <laughs> but with wild animals, like they're doing just fine without us. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure, Sue, that the, and your story demonstrates that the rats deeply appreciated the lovely little treats, but they also demonstrated that they didn't need us. They didn't need those treats. They were perfectly able to make their own way in the world. And so it really is a feeling, a deep feeling of equality. And so that's, that's a really big, um, it's kind of an eye opener to talk with wild animals and realize that if they choose to interact with me, it's, it's not from a place of need or dependency. It's simple generosity. Do wild animals want to talk to us? You know, I think companion animals for the most part do. I feel like they really want to communicate and want us to understand them better and whatnot. And I wonder, are wild animals as open to that or would they just kind of prefer that we stayed in our lane? It's an interesting question. And it really has to do so much with our energy as we show up for the conversation. As with any conversation, even with our companion animals, sure, they're sure. in many cases motivated to talk with us for mutual resolution of situations, problems, health issues, things like that. For wild animals, a lot of times what I experience is there's a genuine curiosity about this human animal who wants to tune in on the universal frequency that all the other species are already quite naturally using because they're not used to us even recognizing that we can. And so there sure. is a motivation for the wild animals to speak with us when we see it from this perspective, because we are just as we have been destroying this planet and destroying their homes, we have great power to restore. We have great ingenuity, great creativity. And when we connect, we, we begin to care. So there is a motivation for them, but it's purely benevolent in the sense of I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be open to this. There's a lot of curiosity in it. Like, huh, that homo sapiens over there just talked to me. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Yeah, I heard it too. What should we say? How should we respond? But then it's like, as the, as it begins to dawn on them, they're like, yeah, Ooh, we could really do something here. We could help. We could help them care more. You know, zoos get a really bad rap and there are some that deserve it. And there are some that are working so hard to do the one thing that matters most for saving this planet for all species, which is to introduce us to each other so that we begin to care. We cannot care about that which we have never experienced and don't understand. And so there's a, there's a, there's a ton of motivation there. But again, it's, it comes with the spirit of, you know, how are we asking the question? It's like, oh, dang it, the squirrels again in my attic. And there, all this anger, all this rage, all this frustration, they're not likely to really want to, to communicate because there is no desire to find... Yeah 
common ground to sure. be respectful, to recognize that what's needed is to learn how to share. Sue was okay with sharing, with a couple rats anyway. She just didn't want them taking over her backyard oasis. She says they got the message fast. They needed to move on, but I didn't mean for one of them to, you know, get, get mm. sort of like a mafia message, like, okay, I'm going to... I'm going to get this one. You're next. And boy, they packed up and they took off. Then what were the signs that you saw that they were leaving and how quickly did this happen? Uh, pretty quick. Um, after that one, you know, that was it. Um, cats came uh, immediately. They were, you know, there was one or two here and there, but as soon as the Hawk did his business. Um, there were two neighbor cats that were constantly roaming on my fence. And I was like, wow, they didn't even say goodbye. It's so silly. I'm such an animal dork sometimes, but um, they didn't come back. So within a matter of days, they were gone. Matter of days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I spoke to Shannon and it was, I swear it was like three days, maybe four days yeah, just to my memory. And, um, and then that was that. Wow. Like, wow. It's pretty remarkable. So your oasis is yours again. <laughs> yeah. Now, now there's a toddler, so that's a little different, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> what I learned really was wow, this works. And it's kind of along the lines of what Shannon has said is, it's like, we know it works, but maybe our species hasn't been trained, trained to believe that it works. The animals are like, well, duh, I know it works. And I didn't realize it was going to happen so quickly. Um, and it was fun. And so I kept trying other ways to communicate and ooh, that would work too. Um, in regards to my yard now, I have two cats. My daughter's two cats came to live with us and, but we still have the squirrels and the possums and the occasional skunk. And, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to plant more flowers to get more bees. I don't think there's enough bees and I, my heart belongs to the bees and the butterflies. Um, just started getting a few of those. And teaching my two-year-old granddaughter, you know, when we fill the bird feeder with water, let's, let's make a little rock moat in case bees get stuck. And I see her saying we need to help the bees. And um, I think overall, the best answer is I'm, I learned that this works and it should work because it's how the world works, how the universe works, and it brings such joy. Thanks so much for listening to Rover Says. If you like the show, please rate it and share so other people who want to know how animals really think can find us. And we'd like to hear from you. Tell us what your animals are telling you or what they've told animal communicators. We drop new episodes every other Wednesday.